Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. My name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, and I am happy to be back with you guys after our holiday break. It's been uh, several weeks now since we've been able to have Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so, uh, uh, delighted to be back seeing you. Good to see everybody back in, well, not everybody, but good to see so many of you here uh, back in Discord tonight. Uh, and uh, hi to folks just on the Twitch channel and folks in the Talon. We're all here and we're all ready to go and get back to the high drama of the Council of Elrond. Um, and of course, I, I tease the Council of Elrond, but I love that this chapter, like this chapter uh, was always one like I remember even as a kid looking forward uh, to the Council of Elrond because we like find out so many things in the Council of Elrond uh, and I always loved it. So anyway, um, off we um off we go, and I'm just going to jump straight into it uh, today. Uh, we'll I'll come back and we'll do some questions and stuff for next time. But I wanted to I wanted to jump straight into the text here tonight because I've been I've been pining for some textual discussion here. Um, so, and I'm fairly confident where I'm taking a risk because Elrond. I've titled this class Elrond takes the floor, but we're not actually going to get to the place where Elrond takes the floor until like. Um, the second slide. <laughs> so this is here's hoping that we get through at least two whole uh, two whole slides here tonight. Okay. So remember, uh, uh, Glowen was just coming towards the end of um, of his uh, of his explanations. Uh, he had just uh, so he had just told us how the messenger from Mordor had said, do you refuse, right? Remember that, that, that question that I really love how that's phrased? At that his breath came like the hiss of snakes, and all who stood by shuddered. But Dayan said, I say neither yea nor nay. I must consider this message and what it means under its fair cloak. Consider well, but not too long, said he. The time of my thought is my own to spend, answered Dayan. For the present, said he, and rode into the darkness. Uh, so let's just start with this final exchange here. Lincoln, I agree with you that um, uh, Dan performs pretty well here, right? And uh, I find this exchange a lot of fun. And let's kind of unpack it a little bit. Look, look a little bit more closely at what the two of them are clearly really saying to each other, right? There's... Uh, there's uh, some indirect speech going on in both directions, right? Um, Dan refuses to commit himself one way or the other. I say neither yea nor nay, right? But notice where he comes... If he just said that, if he said, I say neither yea nor nay, I must consider this message, that would be mere procrastination, right? Um, but he goes beyond that, right? Uh, I must consider this message and what it means under its fair cloak, Right. Um, that is, Dan points clearly to the fact that I know that you're not saying what you mean. Right. Uh, your your message has a fair outside, but there's something serious underneath it. Right. And I have to consider what it is that you're really saying, what really lies under uh, your request and your message here. I know you're not being straight with me. I understand that you are making a threat to me uh, rather than just extending friendship and uh, an offer of allegiance, right? Um, so he's, so on the one hand, is, is he being politic? Yeah, he is. But he's also being fairly clear, right, about the fact that he suspects him. I mean, this is, that's not, uh, although he's still being fairly indirect, that last statement is not the most diplomatic thing he could possibly have said, right? That is not calculated not to offend. It's not calculated to be an open offense, right? It's not a declaration one way or the other. He's not saying, I won't help you. He's not saying, I'll give you a message to send back to Sauron, right? He's not saying, but he is saying very explicitly, right? Um, I see what you're doing, right? I am on to you and I'm not having any of this. Right. Um, I'm not just going to play along with you. I'm not intimidated by you. Right. Uh, and uh, I'm not just going to play along. Uh, and uh, but again, he's he's also he, he's not 
showing no diplomacy at all, right? Again, he's ma- he's levying no insults. Uh, he has said nothing actionable, right? And yet he has made it very clear that he's not to be trifled with either. <laughs> and yeah, it's true. Uh, Praise Moiter says it looks fair and feels foul. And Brandon points out it kind of looks a little foul too. Yeah, exactly. Again, even the word cloak, right? Um, Because, yeah, he's not even going quite so far as saying that it looks fair, right? He's merely acknowledging that there is a cloak of fairness, right? Uh, That uh, there's some friendliness of language which has decorated some of what you're saying, right? But he's under no illusion about the actual fairness of anything underneath that cloak. Um, The response, of course, is consider well, but not too long, right? So that is, the guy does not make the demand, right? He doesn't... um, he doesn't say like, you know, uh, 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 no, you do not have, you know, like you must answer right now. Right. He's a consider well, but not too long. Right. I will not be just, I will not be merely stalled indefinitely. Right. Um, you are good to, to, and, and again, in, in doing this, the messenger is in a sense reiterating what he did by framing his question the way that he did. Do you refuse? Right. Um, uh, refuse and it shall not seem so well. Do you refuse? Which is not very different from saying, "Are you going to say yes or or no?" Right? Um, are you going to help us or not? Are you going to refuse to help us? Right? So uh, he's he's sort of extending that here. Not only saying a no answer is a refusal. Right? That is a that is a positive action. That is an act of aggression against Sauron. Right? And delaying for too long, also tantamount to a refusal, right? Um, yeah, Arden Cran asks, is Sauron really prepared to attack the dwarves immediately if they refuse now? Uh, <laughs> Arden Cran, I'm tempted to say, no, he's probably not. Uh, you can tell on account of how he's not attacking right now, right? But, um, uh, but, but in any case, it's clear that he's, he's got things in motion, right? This is not just a, like, if you don't say yes, then I'm going to go back and figure out what to do. Like, we know that armies are going to be moving against Dan not too long from now, from the point of view of the movement of armies around a continent. Um, so it's clear that things are already in preparation for the attack that he's planning to, uh, uh, to launch against the dwarves. Um, Gilgon Theoret says, would the dwarves know if he was or not? I, I don't know. I don't know how much intelligence they would have. That is, you know, how accurate would be their reports, how, uh, um, uh, how clearly they would be able to know for sure, uh, what Sauron's capability was. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's true. They do have a crack Raven scout regiment. Mad violinist. That's absolutely true. Um, so he probably has enough information to know that there's not an army within instant striking distance. But but again, like he's not just concerned about today, right? He will also know enough to know that there are plenty of armies in the east that could be brought against him. I I cannot imagine that the question. Might this just be a completely empty threat by Sauron is really one that that Dan is thinking about, right? Um, He may well be thinking, is there, I mean, is there anything fair under the fair cloak, right? Is this simple deception? Is is Sauron himself just stalling, right? Trying to get us to agree to work with him, uh, and then he's just going to betray us later on. Um, Yeah, so Angrist... Okay, that's a really interesting question, and it requires a bigger answer than I have time to give to it right now. Um, so I'll give a short answer, which I'll try to explain another time, or maybe in another place. This would actually be a good thing to talk about on my Grifflet channel. Uh, so if Phil, my lore monkey, is listening, maybe note this down, and I'll talk about this during Grifflet. But the question is, do the dwarves know that Sauron is a Maya? Depending on what the dwarves know of the Maya, uh, Maya's powers, it might scare them uh, to compliance. Um, my answer is, I don't think the whole... B- Readers seem to be always much more impressed about the whole being a Maya situation than the people of Middle-earth are. Um, I'm not even sure that that's a real active category 
in the minds of almost anybody. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, so I, I don't think that I, I just yeah, I, I don't think that that's a, a, a in the end itself a super relevant question. Um, uh, anyway, OK, but as I say, there's much more that could be said about that. Um, Dan's response. So, you know, the, the guys just said, I'll give you time, but keep in mind that if you take too much time, I'm going to take that as a no, right? As a refusal. For the time of my, th the time of my thought is my own to spend, answered Dan. Back off, buddy, and don't rush me, right? I'm the king over here, right? Uh, you know, like, are you giving me a deadline here? Like, are you threatening me right now and saying you're going to attack by a certain time or something? Like, seriously, is that what's happening here? I'm the king and my thought is, the time of my thought is my own to spend for the present, said he, and rode into the darkness. That is to say, yes, yes, you are the king and no, no, I'm not threatening you right now, right? I'm not, but uh, the time is going to come. Right. Um, this is all about the veiled threats, right? The veiled and vague threats uh, for the future. And the, the, the messenger is keeping it that way. Right. Um, yeah. Heavy have the hearts of our chieftains been since that night. We needed not the fell voice of the messenger to warn us that his words held both menace and deceit. For we knew already that the power that has re-entered Mordor has not changed, and ever it betrayed us of old. Twice the messenger has returned and has gone unanswered. The third and last time, so he says, is soon to come, before the ending of the year. And so I have been sent at last by Dan to warn Bilbo that he is sought by the enemy, and to learn, if may be, why he desires this ring, this least of rings. Also, we crave the advice of Elrond, for the shadow grows and draws nearer, we discover that messengers have come also to King Brandon Dale, and that he is afraid. We fear that he may yield. Already war is gathering on his eastern borders. If we make no answer, the enemy may move men of his rule to assail King Brand and Dan also. Okay. Um, oh yeah, there are several things here, isn't it? Um, Matt says uh, he likes how the veiled threat essentially removes the future from the conversation. The present in its ambiguously short time is all they are left with, right? Yes, for the present, right? Uh, uh, the future is kind of up to us, right? For the present, you are in control, right? In the future, whether your time is your own, whether you're going to have any, you know, independent authority over your own time, yet to be determined, right? Uh, and that might be kind of up to us. Um, yeah. I like deceit is one of the words that I am most interested in, uh, in that, uh, that first paragraph after the dialogue. Um, when Glowen says, we needed not the fell voice of the messenger. So, like, he sounded really creepy. Like, we get that, like, kiss of snakes thing and the shuddering of those who stand nearby. And uh, Dan says, um, yeah, you know, we didn't need that, right? We didn't need to be creeped out by the messenger um, in order to warn us that his words held both menace and deceit. Menace, absolutely. I mean, the menace is very, well... I was about to say explicit. It's not exactly explicit. It is quite clear, right? But he's still being fairly indirect uh, about the malice, right? But the deceit, right? The deceit. Um, his words held both menace and deceit. I mean, it's clear. He must be lying, right? He must be attempting to, to deceive us, and we could just tell. Right, Tony says this comes off like the dwarvish version of my heart tells me. Right, yes, perhaps so. Um, this is based, they say, on historical precedent. Right, for we already knew that the power that was that has re-entered Mordor has not changed, and ever it betrayed us of old. The dwarves, and what that ever it betrayed us of old. 
that's one of the most tantalizing bits uh, of this passage here, because we don't really know what he's referring to there, right? I mean, we know one thing that he's probably referring to, but ever he betrayed us of old suggests that there were multiple betrayals of the dwarves by Sauron in the past that the dwarves hold in memory, which is hardly surprising because they also hold them in grudge, right? Um, and the dwarves are good about that. However, um, the... We, again, we only really know one, and that's the rings themselves, the seven dwarf rings, right? The giving of the seven dwarf rings by Sauron was a, was a betrayal, right? That was a deceit. Um, Ever it betrayed us of old certainly can be referring back to the giving of the seven rings, right? Um, and then, of course, the recall of the seven uh, of the, the, the seven rings. Um, Trifle says, perhaps the destruction of Eregion? Possibly, of course, like we have to keep in mind, these are the long beards, right? These, the, the of old that he refers to here certainly stretches back not only through the history of Erebor, but through into Khazad, into Khazad-dum as well, right? And that is right, was next door neighbors, right, with Eregion, where the rings of power were made. So um, there was certainly opportunity um, for... Uh, for betrayal. Kurtzimus, I was thinking about the death of Thror as well, and, and certainly there's a betrayal there of a, of a kind, but not exactly. I mean, it's not a betrayal precisely. I mean, Thror marches into Moria single-handedly, uh, apparently unarmed, and gets his head chopped off for it. Like, that's not... I mean... It's not nice, but it's not exactly a betrayal, nor was Sauron exactly responsible for that either. I mean, he wasn't really calling the shots. Um, uh, yeah, exactly, Mornowin. Betrayal implies that there was some level of trust, some kind of interaction between Sauron and the dwarves in which the dwarves had some, uh, as you say, some level of trust in him, and that trust was betrayed. The Rings of Power clearly fit that, right? The, it's a gift that's given to the dwarves, and they're told it will. It is a, a, a beneficial gift, right? Um, but it is designed for their ensnarement. So even though it doesn't do as much harm as Sauron intended it to do, it doesn't make Sauron's actions any less of a betrayal, right? So again, that obviously fits the pattern. The plural there, you know, the uh, ever it betrayed us of old, um, is possibly just a generalization, right, from that instance, um, you know, we, uh, we saw, we knew, we believe, you know, that betrayal to represent the character of Sauron, right? And so it was, uh, you know, um, it could be, uh, um, uh, it could be, uh, uh, you know, sort of a generalization sort of based on that, um, um, I agree, Brandon. There certainly are opportunities. For, I mean, the wars that are right there in Eregion afterwards. Um, uh, Elrond is about to mention uh, when the doors of Moria are shut, right? So there are certainly opportunities for betrayals that we don't really know about. Crownless, it is possible that if you count the gift of each one of the Seven Rings as an individual betrayal, right, that... Uh, that um, Certainly counts as multiple betrayals. I absolutely agree, um, but I um, I wouldn't I wouldn't think so. I mean, again, like the I don't the seven rings of the dwarves were not. I think, as far as we know, given serially over a long period of time. So I don't think they would. Uh, it would necessarily count as ever of old. Mad violinist, that's a great question. Uh, do they associate dragons with Mordor? Perhaps you know, and so see. Even the coming of Smaug as being another, even if indirect, um, uh, you know, sort of betrayal by Sauron. It's possible. It's possible. Um, uh, but um, it's conceivable, Matt, that he could be speaking a little bit more broadly in his use of us, right? That, so that even potentially embracing... Um, the elves and the men, it would make sense in one sense that uh, be, it, us in the sense of the, the people to whom Glowin is addressing, right? Ever betrayed us, like all of us around this table, like we all, 
we all know this, right? We've all been there. Um, uh, it's possible. It's possible that, that that's the sense in which he means an Everett betrayed us of old. I, if I had to guess, I would say no, though. I think he's referring to the point of view of the chief of the chieftains of the dwarves whose hearts were heavy after the meeting with the messenger. Um, uh, and that the us refers specifically to the dwarves in which case it could just very well be, it would seem to me likely to be yet another instance of something that we've seen. We see so many times in Tolkien and that is the example of an untold tale, right? Um, you know, Tolkien, suggesting this wealth of history and stories that are not ever narrated. Um, it's not hard to imagine that there might have been other betrayals by Sauron of the dwarves, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, good. Kronos was asking, why are they not surprised that Sauron is back? And I agree with Brandon. He's publicly declared himself. Um, and that has already happened. Remember, the messenger leads with that. Sauron the Great, right, um, uh, sends to you. So he is, this is, uh, um, he is no longer underground, right, he, uh, figuratively speaking. He is no longer concealing himself under the guise of the necromancer. Um, he has you know, come out of the arch villain closet there and, and, and proclaimed himself. Um, yeah. And I agree, Brandon, he is trying to intimidate, um, not antagonize. Yes. I mean, he would like the dwarves to submit quietly or at least stay out of it. Right. And ideally help with the, I mean, even if they say anything incidental, accidental, um, if, even if they were to try to lie to him, about the ring and where the ring might be that might give them something to work with. Right. So if, 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 if he can compel the dwarf, if he can deceive the dwarves and even addressing the ring question, that's a bonus. Right. Um, but ideally, uh, they're certainly also going to be intimidated into taking the friendship, right. Of the Lord, um, in order to, uh, just be on the sidelines. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Um, exactly, Tony. Sauron has previously declared himself Lord of all Middle Earth and is reasserting uh, th that claim to authority here. Absolutely. Um, he claimed that title way back in the Second Age. Right. That's why he got into a fight with the Numenorians, ultimately. Um, yeah. Yeah. And JJ, I agree. Even if Dan refuses, if the dwarves fear enough, there may be internal strife. Another consequence of the very public nature of this hearing. Right. Um, the fact that the dwarves fear a potential break with not like total break of uh, of friendship, but um, a potential division, you know, between them and, and Bard, a policy division, right? If Bard gives in, even if they don't, it's going to make things much harder for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ah, now, Sean, that's a really interesting point. Sean says that, w what about the capture of Thran? No, when Thran was captured, they did not know that that was Sauron. Um, is it possible, Sean, that that the capture and imprisonment of Thran is one of the betrayals that they're referring to? That I think is possible. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, they would not have known that that was uh, Sauron. In fact, one thing I don't know. I'm trying to remember if there's any reference to this. Sorry, the question I just found myself asking, Sean, inspired by your question, is uh, uh, by your point, is that um, whether or not we are explicitly told, we know that Sauron declares himself, he goes to Mordor and openly declares himself. This we know. We know that nobody knew that the necromancer was actually Sauron until Gandalf went and met Thran, right, and got the map and key from him, and while he was there in Dol Guldur, discovered and was the first among the wise in the White Council to confirm that the necromancer was actually Sauron, right? 
until then, it was not known for sure who or what the necromancer was. There were some suspicions, but nobody knew for sure, right? My question is, when Sauron moved to Mordor and openly declared himself, does that mean that everybody knew? Did he, did he say that he had been the necromancer? Or is that still unknown? Um, Sauron appears, right? Reappears in Mordor and declares himself. But does that mean that everybody knows that, oh yeah, that necromancer guy? Yeah, that had been Sauron all along. Gandalf found out again, but it's not like he published it, right? You know, Gandalf didn't post that on his blog. Elrond knows that and several other people know that. Um, in the, you know, in, in the Council of the Wise. Uh, but would it be known? Like, would Dan know? Would, you know, would Thranduil know? Maybe Thranduil would know. You know, would, would um, you know, the Bardings of Dale know that the Necromancer of Mirkwood had actually been Sauron all along? Turns out was Sauron all along. Is that a piece of information that they would generally have? I'm not really sure. That's n It's not explicitly said, and I don't no, I don't think that we're necessarily safe in assuming uh, that that's common knowledge. Um, would most people who are not in the White Council be under the vague impression that the Necromancer was just a dude who was defeated by um, the White Council? You know, they went in and they kicked his butt and he left and... Mirkwood got better, and then later on, in a totally unrelated development, Sauron appeared in Mordor and declared himself again, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I... Yeah. There are lots of possibilities, Kurtzimus. I mean, keep it, Kurtzimus is asking who else could the Necromancer be? Any number of people, right? I mean, those who were uh, among the wise, one of the leading theories was that it was one of the ringwraiths, right? Possibly the witch king of Angmar. Um, uh, but, um, and that's certainly a very plausible theory, but I mean, especially if you're not one of the elven wise, I mean, look, the, we all know there are wizards wandering about. You can see them sometimes, right? I mean, there's another wizard dude who lives in Mirkwood, right? Uh, so, like, that there would be two wizards in Mirkwood, one of which was nice and liked to hang out with small furry animals, and the other of which liked to apparently, like, commune with the dead and uh, infest the forest with a dark spirit of evil. Like, you know, wizards come in all flavors and colors, right? One of them apparently being black, right? So, okay. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't seem like a stretch. Uh, from, again, from, like, your common... Uh, like, you know, from the point of view of like your average, uh, you know, person in the Bjorning lands or, or, or even like, you know, men of Rohan or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, so yes, trifle. Yes. The Hobbit, the Hobbit does almost make it seem like that. Yes. Like it's just another dude. Yes. And of course, trifle, there's a good reason for that, right? The reason that the Hobbit makes it seem like that is because because it was like that when Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, right? Um, the necromancer was, in fact, just a dude. You know, there were, there were a bunch of wizards in the land, and some of them were good, and there was a council of those good ones, you know, the White Council of Wizards, and there was apparently a few, at least a few rogues, right? And uh, so, of course, it was the job of the good wizards uh, to get together and... Um, you know, boot out the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the bad egg, right? Um, that's, um, you know, that's the, uh, um, uh, th that is the story, uh, at the time that the Hobbit was written. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Um, and yes, Tony, the Witch King was the Wizard King for a long time. And I, or not only a long time, I mean, yeah, like in the draft history of the Lord of the Rings. I mean, we were well into like the Return of the King material when the, the Witch King was still being referred to as the Wizard King. In fact, I think the entire first draft of the whole of the Lord of the Rings was written before the name Wizard King was changed to Witch King. And, um, and for most of that time, he was seen as a direct counterpart 
the Witch King of Angmar now we're talking about as a direct counterpart to Gandalf, basically. You know, again, he was an example uh, of that. So you can see that Tolkien seemed to have had that idea originally with the necromancer in The Hobbit, right? And then he changed his mind about the necromancer. No, no, no. The, ne the necromancer is actually Sauron in disguise, right? But what did he do? He did the Tolkien thing, right? Which is not throw away that idea that he had and changed, right? She's like, okay, but this idea of like rogue wizard who has turned to darkness. Oh yeah, that's still viable, right? And the Lord of the Ring Wraiths is going to be that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so all kinds of, um, um, all kinds of possibilities there. Oops, sorry, went the wrong way there. Um, so yeah, anyway, we're getting a little bit sidetracked, but again, the point is I don't think that they would have known in retrospect. I don't see any positive evidence that people outside of this room, outside the room of the Council of Elrond, um, you know, though like Gandalf and those people to whom he directly communicated this information, which would hardly have been on street corners, right, um, would have known that the necromancer had actually turned out to be um, turned out to be Sauron. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, there's a there's a rich tradition of wizardry um, beyond just the Astari. Um, they're, they're, um, the Numenorean stuff, absolutely. The Numenorians are mixed up in wizardry um, at various points. Um, as Tony says, even Merlin uh, in C.S. Lewis's stories is from Numenor, right? Yeah, exactly. Or at least uh, participating in Numenorean magic, right? Now, you can be like, well, that's in C.S. Lewis. That's not in, in Tolkien. No, of course it's not. It's therefore not authoritative, right? But I also don't think that came out of nowhere, right? There's a reason that uh, Lewis, when he wrote that hideous strength, associated Merlin and that early kind of druidic wizardry with Numenor, right? Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, that reason came from what he had heard about Numenor uh, and Westerness uh, from Tolkien in Inklings meetings. So anyway. Um, yeah. Okay, Mad Violence, I'm going to resist the temptation to uh, uh, allow the conversation to turn on to purely philological lines. Uh, Chris is talking about the word, the use of the word sorcery by Tolkien uh, to encompass evil magic. Yeah, that's most conspicuous, of course, in Minas Morgul, Tower of Sorcery. Um, but, um, but yeah, we'll... Let's save that. Let's save that for a later day. And let's get back to poor Dan, whom, whom we've left hanging here. Um... The third and last time, so he says, is soon to come before the ending of the year. So the threats of not quite imminent, but uh, not too distant future reprisals against the dwarves have not yet been enacted. Right. Um, in even though it's been it's been some time. Right. So a certain amount of leeway is being given to them. Um, JJ, there's not a tower of sickledry, but there totally should be. I agree with you. Um, notice what he says there for his messages. Remember, this is what he wouldn't say to Frodo at dinner, right? Um, yes, you're right, Kit. His threats are imminent, but not immediate. That is a much better way of saying it. You're right. Um, I have been sent at last by Dan. One, to warn Bilbo that he is sought by the enemy. I love that he puts that first, right? Um, far from contemplating, you know, selling Bilbo out to the enemy, like let's 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 um, let's throw Bilbo to the wolves and hope that maybe Sauron will leave us alone, right? That seems clearly what the messenger of Mordor seems to have in mind here, right? But far from that, um, uh, the first priority. Glowen claims uh, to the message um, is that Bilbo is sought by the, the enemy's looking for you, man. The jig is up, right? Like, uh, you know, we're not 100% sure why he's after you or what exactly that's about, but uh, you better you better know that. And two, to learn 
Uh, yeah, JJ says, I like that it was apparently one of Dan's priorities and not just Glowin's. Yeah, now Glowin might be bumping it up to the top of the list for personal reasons, but I agree. I think that this, this seems to be, this seems to be Dan's, um, uh, Dan's priority there as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And also, Fourth Dauntless, I do agree with you, too, that we ought to understand this priority as a re- as a realization that whatever Sauron wants, it's not in anyone's interest that he gets it. Yeah, you, so uh, Fourth Dauntless, you, you think they're not buying the whole, tr- you know, a, 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 a trifle that Sauron fancies line, right? Yeah, I think probably not. Probably not. Um, keep in mind, remember back to the conversations we had about I don't know, uh, maybe uh, two and a half years ago um, when we were discussing chapter two. Uh, happy anniversary, by the way. Uh, today's class, I forgot to say this at the beginning, is our uh, uh, is our third anniversary of uh, the beginning of um, of exploring the Lord of the Rings. We're starting our fourth year of our discussions here. Um, uh, but anyway, sorry, I, I meant to say that at the beginning and completely forgot. Um Anyhow, back when we were discussing chapter two, and this is a, you know, this is a a problem a lot of people, a lot of readers have, a lot of readers forget that, um, like, most of the stuff that we are told by Gandalf, this is not at all public knowledge, right? You know, so you might think, like, um, uh, so his second point, right, to learn, if may be, why he desires this ring this least of rings, right? I, you know, I know that a lot of people read passages like this. And I, I mean, I, I, so I've talked to a bunch of people who are like, why are they so dumb? Right? Like it's a ring, right? There's a ring that Sauron really wants. Like, what do you think it is? Like, what else could it possibly be? Remember, people don't know about this. This is not general knowledge at all, right? Even the fact that Sauron had a ruling ring, is not public knowledge, right? Who knew that? Not everybody, right? Your average person on the street, there is no way, um, there is no way that, um, uh, that, like, people, I mean, how many people even know that Sauron forged a ring of power that ruled the other rings? Maybe, maybe that fact is known by the Longbeards. Or rather, maybe that l- was known to the Longbeards of many, many, many generations before, right? But, and it was, as Tony is saying, it was 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago, right? So uh, even with the retentive memories of dwarves, do they even remember that, right? I mean, it's, they remember about their ring, Right, they know about their ring of power, and I I take from the Everett betrayed us of old. I take that to mean that they know that it was um, uh, that that they know that it was a betrayal, right? That they know that it was a trap, um, but but yeah. So anyway, um, it's not at all obvious. There's no reason to think that even to Dan and the 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 Longbeards, um, it would be known, th- even that the One Ring had ever existed. Much less would they have necessary reason to suspect that this was it, right? Um, yeah. So uh, uh, Nahor uh, on the Twitch chat is asking um, the in the Three Rings for the Elven King's poem in the the, the Ring Lore poem, um, who did we decide was the author? Um, it's it is it is recalled in elvish lore right so elvish lore masters that is a rhyme of lore um written by elves right that's that's what we're told about that no reason to think that they've shared that with a wide array of people right um yeah so um anyway yeah there's uh there's lots of reasons to um um Yeah, yeah. So, but so Cecile was asked was wanting to kind of come back to the the question about warning Bilbo first and foremost, right? Um, 
look at the way that it unfolds, right? Um, I've been sent, one, to warn Bilbo that he is sought by the enemy. Two, to learn why he desires this ring. To learn if, if maybe, right? I mean, if anybody knows, like, such an obscure piece of trivia, why he would want this ring. Like, that seems weird to us. We don't get it. And also, we, accru- we crave the advice of Elrond. For the shadow grows and draws nearer, we discover the, you know, we fear that he may yield. Wars gathering on our eastern borders. So, so we've got, going third to first, right, we have the... We would like your advice on our general political situation, right? Like the geopolitics of the northeast of 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 uh, you know of Middle Earth there up in northern Rovanian, things are a little you know. Uh, any suggestions about what we might do and what kinds of things we might expect, right? Um, that is certainly the biggest and weightiest topic of the three things that he br- that he mentions, right? And so he does put it last in in the chief place, fourth Dauntless. I agree, um, but it's also again the biggest, broadest, and most general uh, of those. Second, he places the business about this ring. Like we're kind of curious about this. We don't get it, right? In one sense, there's nothing urgent about it because they don't have the ring. Um, and they can't, couldn't give it to Sauron if they wanted to. So it's it's sort of um, an item of curiosity on their part, right? They they were they're trying to understand, and it's not just idle curiosity. I mean, they would like to understand why he wants this ring because perhaps understanding that would help them in turn to understand uh, like what's going on, like what lies behind this, what in fact is under that fair cloak, right? What is going on here? What is Sauron's plan? And if we knew what that ring was and why it was a big deal, maybe we'd understand better, right? Um, yeah, so um, then back to the first point, Bilbo. So of all of these things, we would like Elrond's general advice, and that's important, but it's sort of a big thing. We'd like to know about this ring because it seems like it might help us to know if we could understand better what the heck's going on with him, Sauron, that is. But first, most specifically, we need to. We I came to deliver this message to Bilbo personally, right? The enemy, you know, Sauron is looking for you personally, man. So you better mind your p's and q's, right? Um, so that's that's interesting. I think uh, Gilgon Theer points out that geographically, he says, would the mountain be closer to Gondor or to Rivendell? I would assume Rivendell. Um. When you add in that there's the mountains to cross in between, I can't imagine that Rivendell is way more convenient to the Lonely Mountain than Gondor is. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, there's more, they're more part of the, you know, there's the whole, there's the northern world and there's the southern world, right? Um, I say that not because. In a sense, not because the dwarves of Erebor don't care about the south and don't care about men, but because men are irrelevant to them. The kingdom of Gondor, even in its heyday, did not extend that far into the north, right? So it was not a daily reality. It, this is not like um, a situation where, like, one can imagine, one can imagine a situation in which, um, uh, in which, Rohan might seek aid from Gondor. Right. Because like they're traditional allies. Right. Uh, Even maybe somebody who is a little nearer than that. But the dwarves, like, what did they ever have to do with Gondor? Nothing. Right. Um, But they know that in the old days and hey, Sauron the Great has returned to Mordor and declared himself again. So that gets us thinking back to old days, like the War of the Last Alliance. Right. I mean, Sauron in Mordor openly declaring himself as Sauron the Great really kind of cast you back to those days of the Wars of the Last Alliance when dwarves fought alongside elves and men against Sauron, right? And Gondor isn't what it was, and in any case, again, it's not the present reality. So that they would come to Elrond first rather than going to Gondor makes all kinds of sense, right? Um, And as you say, Flammifer, the dwarves also travel to the west regularly. Um, That's, yeah. Yeah, the, the dwarf road that goes across and their travel, uh, even traffic through Mirkwood, um, is um, that's 
that's definitely the way that they m more usually go. There's no evidence that they ever go south. So I, I do definitely agree. And Angrist, I, I also agree with that. Um, who in Gondor could counsel them, right? I mean, sure, there's Denethor. Like, there's a lord down there, but they don't know him, right? Have they ever even heard of him? I mean, like, would they know his name? Probably. Maybe they would know Denethor's name. But who the heck is he, right? Elrond of Rivendell, though? You know, you need advice? You go to Elrond of Rivendell, right? I mean, come on, right? That's been known for quite some time. So, uh, so yeah. Um, Arden Cran asks, would the dwarves have asked Thranduil first? <laughs> Is he not as revered as Elrond? No, he's not as revered as Elrond. And is Dan going to ask the Elven King for advice? Maybe. I mean, there's Baryon in the hatchet, and then there's Baryon in the hatchet, right? I mean, like, uh, I, you know... Um, and the Wood Elves are less wise, Lady Shmebulok, absolutely. Even the narrator of The Hobbit says so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good. Tony points out that they have a personal history with Elrond. Like, Glowen himself was here in Rivendell and received the advice of Elrond. So, sure. Absolutely. Um, and yes, uh, uh, Praise Moira is exactly what I was thinking. Um, the dwarves have had positive history with Elrond, and less so with Thranduil. Yes, very tactfully stated there. Um, and Kurtzimus, absolutely. They, they want to warn Bilbo anyway, and they know he's here. So, so yep, I agree. Two birds, one stone uh, on, that, uh, uh, on that question. So that makes all kinds of sense, and they're worried about the political situation. So let's move on to Elrond then. You have done well to come, said Elrond. You will hear today all that you need in order to understand the purposes of the enemy. There is naught that you can do other than to resist, with hope or without it. But you do not stand alone. You will learn that your trouble is but part of the trouble of all the Western world. The ring. What shall we do with the ring? The least of rings. The trifle that Sauron fancies. That is the doom that we must deem. That is the purpose for which you are called hither. Called, I say, though I have not called you to me, strangers from distant lands. You have come and are here met in this very nick of time, by chance as it may seem, yet it is not so. Believe rather that it is so ordered that we who sit here, and none others, must now find counsel for the peril of the world. Now therefore things shall be openly spoken that have been hidden from all but a few until this day. And first, so that all may understand what is the peril, the tale of the ring shall be told from the beginning even to this present. And I will begin that tale, though others shall end it. Okay, so much here, my goodness. Um, okay. Uh, Arden Cran, I've always loved the sentence, that is the doom that we must deem. Um, that's the sentence I always quote when people, when we're, when, when, when we're, when I'm discussing with people the concept of doom in Tolkien's world, right? That is, that sentence is such a beautiful illustration of the double meaning of doom, right? Doom, both in the sense of a doom that is laid upon you, right? A fate that is laid upon you, but also a choice that you make, right? You deem a doom. Uh, and the power of people to doom, to, ju to judge for themselves, to make a decision, right, is, is central to that sentence. And yet the thing certainly shall be uh, a doom. And, um, and absolutely, Fourth Donalus, I agree. One of the most shocking things here is his um, open acknowledgement that he didn't call this meeting, right? Um, that is the purpose for which you are called hither. Called, I say, though I have not called you to me. Strangers from distant lands. Um, let's, okay, let's do what I usually do and take each paragraph in turn. He begins um, with an open acknowledgement of, again, something that I've already been pointing to, that I already want to remind us of, and, and, and strongly want to remind us of again. Um, Elrond says, and he's going to say it again in paragraph three on this slide, 
um, that things shall be spoken, shall be openly spoken today that have been hidden from all but a few. It is not only that just some people know and others have not happened to hear, right? The lore that is known to the few has been actively concealed from the many, right? That's, that is something that he is openly, openly acknowledging here. Um, uh, so the, again, it's always so easy for people to forget how much time has passed since the forging of the rings of power. Um, even since the, the battle of the last, the war of the last alliance and how much geography we're talking about separating events. So massive distances in space and in time uh, that have separated every, all contemporary people from these historical events, right? But then you add on to those things, the fact that the true knowledge of these things has been actively hidden, right? Um, you will hear today, he says, I'll, uh, yeah, actually, hang on a second. Let me address it before I go on to that. Belongsman, yeah, Belongsman says, and in a vastly illiterate world. Yes, illiterate, because writing is rare and unnecessary, right? This is the thing to keep in mind. Literacy is only a relevant skill when writing is a common thing. Um, that might seem circular, but it isn't exactly circular. When your culture is predominantly an oral culture, literacy is not the prime important skill. Uh, memory, the ability to recall and recite accurately things, that is so much more important than literacy if you're living in an oral culture, right? Um, and elves don't seem to write stuff down very much, which, of course, makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, yes, elves invent languages and things like that, and Fanor is famous for his script and all that kind of thing. Uh, it's not that they didn't have writing, but elves are an oral culture in a different kind of way than most human oral cultures, right? Um... Right, exactly, Kurtzimus. It's because they live forever. Um, I'm sure that many of you, um, I'm sure that many of you have been in a situation like have been part of a a club or a a company or a team of some kind, some group of people, right? That you were maybe a part of from the very beginning or from close to the beginning, and for as long as you and the original members of the club are around and everything, like nobody feels any need to write anything down. Right? Why should you? You were all there. You all remember it. Right? It fact in, in fact seems a little strange. Right? Seems a little silly almost. Like uh, self-aggrandizing to like let us write out a history of all this stuff, right? Um, but as time goes by and people start, you know, retiring or leaving or dying, right? Then the need that that perceived need like okay, if we don't if we don't write this down, right? If we don't write down the history of our family, of these people or whatever, of this group, of this team, this club, uh, then it, it's, it's going to get lost, right? Um, elves are like that, right? Except they don't do that, right? They don't die. So, you know, like a thousand, ten thousand, right? A hundred thousand years could go by before elves are like, oh yeah, should we write this down? I guess, you know, right? I mean, it's, um, um, because no angrist, they don't seem to forget in the same way over 3,000 years. No, not in the same way. I, I, elvish memories work differently. Um, I think we've got some evidence for that. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah. So the, um, yeah, exactly. Trifle. They, uh, the, they, they don't have history in the, in the, in the same sense that mortals use the word history. It's somebody's memory and you can probably just meet one of the people, you know, who was, uh, who was there. Um, so, um, yes. Yes. Um, anyhow, so I, it's totally understandable, the more you think about it, that elves would not spend a very great deal of their time committing things to writing. Um, now, Elrond is considered a great lore master, right? And there are clearly things written down in Elrond's house about, say, the First Age, 
right? About what the elves, what happened to the Noldor and Valinor and about the wars in Beleriand and everything. And there's a good reason for that because a very great number of those died. Elrond knows. Elrond is well aware of the fact that he is one of a comparatively small group of elves who not only survived the First Age, but did not go back into the West at the end of the War of Wrath and instead chose to stay in Middle-earth. So when Elrond chooses to stay in Middle-earth, he knows that one of the primary reasons he's doing that is that he is like a bridge between the Elder Days that have gone and the Newer Ages that are coming. Right. And so he does seem to have written um, works of lore. And for Thoughtless, you're right. He didn't personally witness most of those events, so he can't rely on his own original uh, memory anyway. Absolutely. Agree with that. Um, um, yes, Kurtzimus, I often think about that passage. Um, that writing is a poor substitute for memory. Uh, uh, ask Socrates. Yes. I mean, people... <laughs> Ironically, people forget this, right? That um, I've often brought this up in the context of people complaining about the shift from print to electronic text, right? And how that changes things. Um, and, you know, people being like, oh, it's nothing, you know, it's, it's nothing like as good as when we had uh, print and saying like, you know, people said the same thing about the printing press when it came out and people said the same thing about writing in the first place, right? That, oh, if now we're writing all these books, like there goes memory, right? Which is even better. Absolutely. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, no, that's, that's, that's always been a thing. And there's always with every cha cultural change in those ways, there's something that's gained and there's something that's lost. Um, Yes, Rococo, exactly. How like how we can't remember anybody's phone numbers anymore. Yeah, as one small example of that same kind of phenomenon. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So anyhow, point of all of this is, Blanksbond, this is all your fault. Uh, sorry, just your reference to uh, living in an, in an illiterate world. Um, yes, uh, because, again, most, so for most of these societies, right? For most society, human societies and elvish societies, they are in different ways and with different uh, focuses. They're all oral references. Oral references, sorry, and I'm reading and talking at the same time. They're all oral societies, right? Oral cultures. Um, so it's um, super easy to understand how lore can be not just lost. It's easy enough to, to lose lore even in a written society, right? All you, I mean, in some ways, Gilgonther, as you were pointing out, writing can even make it easier, right? Writing things down, as Gilgonther says, means you're turning the event only into what was written down and everything else eventually gets lost, right? Um, yes. And then, of course, Gilgonther, what, then, then the text gets lost. And there you go, right? Um, and we've, we will see an example of this later in the council, right? When uh, Gandalf is talking about his archival work in Minas Tirith, right? When there are scrolls which do preserve lore and memories, uh, human memories from thousands of years ago, but they're functionally lost. Nobody reads them anymore, right? And so nobody knows it anymore. Um, yeah. And then, of course, Tony, as you say, it's been actively suppressed on top of this. Um yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Valori, I agree. Valori says she remembers that line from Indiana Jones. I wrote them down so I wouldn't have to remember. Yes, that's the problem with writing, right? That's exactly the problem with writing. See, exactly. Uh, um, uh, Socrates would, would sit Dr. Jones Sr. down for a long lecture about that, right? Um, yeah. Okay, anyway. So, look at Sauron's look at Sauron's look at the introduction to Sauron in the rings what Elrond says here at the beginning you will hear today all that you need in order to understand the purposes of the enemy notice how he immediately acknowledges that's that's the point here right you want to understand what Sauron's up to at the end of the day today you will know everything about what Sauron is up to you everything will be clear to you so that's great now here's the uh, advice in a nutshell Right here comes here comes the advice that they craved. Ready for it? There is not that you can do other than to resist with hope or without it. 
Okay, so that's not awesome advice. I mean, at least that's not happy advice. Um, but, um, okay. Uh, resist. My advice is that you res don't give in, right? Don't say yes. Don't temporize. Resist. It might look hopeless. And if it looks hopeless, or indeed if it is hopeless, if the enemy comes after you with a force far too strong possibly for you to resist, my advice is resist him anyway, even without hope, right? No problem. No charge, right? But that's the advice. That's the advice. Um, yeah. Um, and Matt's right. At least it isn't yes and no. Right. It's it's, it's it's pretty definitive advice, uh, even though he has gone to the elves for counsel. But you do not stand alone. You will learn that your trouble is but part of the trouble of all the Western world. So the good news, Glowen, is that everybody else is exactly as screwed as you are. Right. So don't feel bad. Right. Don't feel bad. It'll be good. Um, I mean, no, that's not necessarily true. It might not be good, but we'll all go down together. So, so there's that. Um, <laughs> yeah, Matt Violinist, maybe it is. Uh, he, he is only half an elf, right? So maybe, uh, maybe that's why he, he doesn't say both no and yes. Um, but uh, exactly, Lady Shmabulok, nobody need feel left out uh, of the whole uh, resisting hopelessly uh, uh, endeavor here. You will learn that your trouble is but part of the trouble of all the Western world. The ring. What shall we do with the ring? Now, notice how Elrond has shifted things. He has... What it might... I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in a Glowin's place here. Right? If I put myself in a Glowin's place, that sounds like he's just changing the subject. Right? It sounds like a mere digression on Elrond's part. Because notice, he's just been saying... Um... There is not you can do other than like he he's given the advice. He's taught he's addressing the political situation of the dwarves, right? So it seems like he's jumped over number two to number three, and he's talking about and then he says, You will learn it's but a, a part of the trouble of all the Western world. Okay, so we're we're widening out, right, from the geopolitical situation in, you know, Erebor. Right in northern Rovanian to the geopolitical situation everywhere, right throughout all of the Western world. Okay, the ring. What shall we do with the ring? Whoa. Okay, so seriously, that's the trouble of all the Western world. Um, that's an amazing revelation, and that's got to send Glowin spinning a little bit. Right. Um, yeah. Um, what shall we do with the ring? So first of all, he just says the ring. Um, what shall we do with the ring? The first revelation that he makes is one that he doesn't even really draw attention to, right? He kind of slips that in. He doesn't say the ring. So, piece of news number one, we have it, right? Uh, he, he is the ring. What shall we do with the ring? The least of rings. The trifle that Sauron fancies. Just, again, think about the information that he's giving there. One, Bilbo's ring... Glowen, the ring that you know Bilbo has, that is, that's, that's the whole thing, right? That is, that is the whole purpose is the whole purpose of the enemy, right? It is here, right? It is here in Rivendell. We have it. Um, and we have to decide what to do with it. Um, Several things all confirmed at once, right? And I agree, uh, Trifle, that the uh, the sarcasm in this line is really is really beautiful. What shall we do with the ring? The least of rings, the trifle that Sauron fancies, right? Um, here he seems to be almost making fun of the uh, 
I don't know what claim if I, uh, claim isn't the right word for it. Um, the idea that uh, this is but merely a trifle that Sauron fancies. Um, yeah. Now, Angras says, if ring lore has been actively kept secret, why would those present at the council believe in the danger of it? They wouldn't, Angras. This isn't enough, right? Um, if he just says, yeah, okay, so Sauron does want Bilbo's ring. And Sauron's desire for Bilbo the halfling's invisibility ring is the most important thing in all of Middle-earth. I'm sure there are a whole bunch of people around the table being like, uh, really? Uh, seriously? Like, you know, did, did, did Elrond start early or what's going on here? I mean, it's, um, it's a little strange, right? Definitely hard to understand. Um, exactly, Lincoln. That's why we come to the telling of the tale of the ring, right? Um, when he, te when he, he, he tells them things shall be openly spoken that have been hidden from all but a few at, f and first, the first and most important thing to tell so that all may understand what is the peril, the tale of the ring shall be told from the beginning, even to this present. And I will begin that tale, though others shall end it. So notice what he is promising them, right? There's several things involved in the tale of the ring, as he calls it, right? First, I'm going to explain to you about the rings of power, right? What are the rings of power? Where did they come from? What do they do? And why are they important, right? So that's one thing, right, that he's promising to tell them. Second... I'm going to tell you what happened to Sauron's ring, right? And third, it's going to be told that this ring that we have here with us now is that ring, right? Those are the three things that have to be established. And obviously, we're going to come back to some of those questions explicitly later on uh, in, in the council. And Tony, this is so, so important to remember at this point. None of the members of the council were expecting this when they showed up. No, I don't think they were either. Not at all. Again, um, is Glowen expecting a council of war? Maybe, right? Is the idea... Maybe the highest ambition of anybody who came is that maybe we'll have um, another little alliance, right? Maybe we can maybe we can call that other one the penultimate alliance, right? Uh, you know, and you know, is there a way we can work together? That's clearly in Glowen's mind, right? Can we? Can we? Is there somehow we can work? Can you give us advice, right? How can we all work together in order to oppose Sauron? Because this is obviously. A problem, right? And Elrond says, "Okay, uh, yes, but uh, but there's more to it, right? Um, this is the issue." And Galandar, I absolutely agree that um, this has some risk of derailing the council. Uh, he says, if Boromir and Glowen believe this is just a tangent that takes the focus from their real peril, uh, then they won't buy into anything that happens here and will leave disappointed. Yes, remember, remember what they start off talking about, right? In those first few slides that we were looking at from the very beginning of the chapter, they start with discussing issues and problems around, uh, you know, the northern and western parts of the world. Right. Glowen's story about what's going on in Erebor is given as a representative sample of the kinds of problems and issues that they're discussing that are happening all across the world. That clearly is what they were expecting to come and talk about. That they, they, they had no idea that that was just preamble. Right. They had no idea that that wasn't what the council was about. I mean, that's what everyone has to have assumed. Um. Uh, that's what everyone has to have assumed the council was going to be about. I mean, what could be bigger and more important than that, right? And now here is um, Elrond transitioning the whole thing. Gilgamthir, exactly. They're asking for war advice for their own regions, uh, not to be drawn into a global quest to destroy a magic ring. It's a big ask, right? Um, it's in many ways a strange story. 
Um, Yes, Ambrosius Aureliana says Elrond is actually a pretty good meetings chairman. Uh, he keeps it focused, heads off tangents. It just so happens that the amount of stuff that is still relevant is massive. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, many of you might have heard, um, perhaps at Mythmoot or, or elsewhere, uh, Tom Shippey make the joke that he often likes to make, uh, that Elrond conducts the Council of Elrond like the worst kind of department chair. Uh, and I understand there's definitely a sense in which he's right. Like the, I understand the joke in the sense that it is certainly, I, I, I would, I guess, technically I would turn the joke around the other way around and say really bad department chairs run meetings like, like, like Elrond, right. Or sound like that is, they talk for hours and hours and hours at the beginning without letting anybody else get a word in edgewise. That's primarily the, the thrust of the joke that Tom Shippey makes when he makes that comment. But Ambrosius, Ambrosius Aurelianus, I agree with you, uh, that I think Elrond does a really good job here. And it's super important for us to acknowledge, for us to recognize this is like completely out of left field for almost everybody there. Right. I mean, Remember, most of them will not never have even have known that there were such a thing as as, as rings of power. Right? It's gonna be really, really strange. Um. Uh. Yeah. Um. But notice, we skipped, of course, the transitional paragraph. Right. After he says, this is, that is the doom that we must deem. So he's told them, right? Okay, you, none of you guys knew this was coming. But this apparently random question that Glowen is asking about, what is this ring that Sauron is asking about? Turns out that's the primary agenda item of this entire meeting, right? And I agree, Gilgonthir, Gandalf, Aragorn, uh, a, a couple, I'm not even sure all, of Elrond's household, um... Uh, Bilbo are the only ones who know this kind of thing. Um, yes, absolutely. So Elrond has said, I'm just going to, I'm going to put it out there, right? I know I still have to convince you, but I'm going to put it out there that the doom that we must deem, the function, the primary function and purpose of this whole council is to decide what to do with Bilbo's ring, right? Um, and then before he begins to segue into that, right, with the things shall be openly spoken that have been hidden from all, right, I'm going to reveal to you some secret lore that'll help to contextualize this whole thing. Before he does that, he does that extremely weighty middle paragraphs, right? Middle paragraph. That is the purpose for which you are called hither. Called, I say, though I have not called you to me, strangers from distant lands. I'm never quite sure how to lay the emphasis in that sentence. Called, I say, though I have not called you to me, would be one way to read it. Called, I say, though I have not called you to me, would be another way to read it. Called, I say, though I have not called you to me, strangers from distant lands, would be another way to read it. Um, I think, though I have not called you to me, uh, is probably the best way to read it. But anyway, you have come and are here met in this very nick of time, by chance as it may seem, yet it is not so. Believe rather that it is so ordered that we who sit here and none others must now find counsel for the peril of the world. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, uh, Musical says, I have not called you strangers from distant lands. Yeah, yeah, you could lay the emphasis on the you. I've not called you, um, especially you guys. Like, I mean, come on, Boromir, I didn't even know you were coming. How could I have known that, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, he lays this big whammy on them. And a lot of people... Oh, good. Uh, uh, Freethinker G was saying the same thing up in the Twitch chat about laying the emphasis on you. Um, I have not called you to me. <laughs> I, c 
called some decent, you know, hero types, and I got you guys instead. No, 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 I'm not saying that. But anyway, yeah. Um, I, I saw when I was reading it through, I saw some of you say things like, gosh, no pressure, right? When he says things like, it is so ordered that we who sit here and none others must now find counsel for the peril of the world. Yeah, no pressure, right? Um, before he begins any explanations, right? Again, he lays out his thesis, right? The thesis is we have to decide what to do with the ring. That is the doom that we must deem, right? The fate of the ring is the whole point of this council. And before he begins his preamble to that um, and his explanation of that, he says, I believe, right? I say that this is ordained. It has been so ordered that we who sit here must find counsel for the peril of the world. Um, this isn't random. This isn't arbitrary. And again, this is why I keep coming back to that sentence, that is the doom we must deem in this context, having just emphasized that they have a decision to make. They must take action themselves. They must deem a doom. He then says, because it's been so ordered that we do that, right? Um, it's our doom, in other words, to deem the doom uh, that has to be deemed here. Um, Uh, good. Tony says the and none others emphasizes the time pressure here. Yeah, we can't, uh, we can't, as Sam would say, um, uh, get advice or permission from anybody else, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, ordered by whom? He doesn't say. Notice Elrond's very pointed use of the passive voice in this paragraph. Exactly, musical. That's exactly it. He's very pointed and repeated in his use of the passive voice. That is the purpose for which you are called. It is so ordered. Um... Yeah. Gilgonthir, I agree. It is interesting uh, that the leaders weren't called themselves, like Dan, Denethor, Thranduil, B in a Brand, uh, you know, Grimbjorn. I mean, none of them are, uh, uh, are themselves called here. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, And yes, I do agree that the proximity, uh, for Thalus, the proximity of ordered, and if chance you call it, uh, is a, a big clue for readers of The Hobbit. I agree, and certainly is going to um, bring us back to the words of uh, Gildor and Glorian as well, right? Um, and of Tom Bombadil. Um, there have already been a couple of open acknowledgments that what looks like luck or chance is not, in fact, uh, chance. Um, yeah. Uh, Cecilia, that's a really good connection. Cecilia is uh, remembering that, of course, Elrond had said in his extremely cheerful piece of advice to Glowen that they don't stand alone. Um, your trouble is but part of the trouble of all the Western world, the ring, right? And Cecilia is, is uh, sort of saying that this in this next paragraph, um, he says, you know, all of them are called together, right, to figure out what is... Uh, you know, to, 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 to deem the doom, right? Uh, none of them are alone either. None of them are making it uh, by themselves. All of the Western world stands together in the same peril and should stand together in resistance. Um, we here at the Council, as microcosm of that Western world, that sampling of the Western world who has been ordered to be here in some sense, right, has been called to here, um, we also are brought together and should stand or, well, I guess, sit together uh, in order to uh, uh, to deem the doom. Um, now, I agree. Uh, why isn't he... Um, 
Right. Tarlone Hill says, no more keeping secrets. Let me begin by being vague about what I mean. Yeah, Tarlone Hill, though it's n still not as egregious as Gandalf's comment in chapter two, right, where he says, I can put it no plainer than by saying, you were me Bilbo was meant to find the ring. No, no clear. It's not possible to be plainer than that, Gandalf, and I'm still not going to say. Um, uh, yeah, I agree. But... Um, uh, but I certainly agree with JJ that if Elrond has to go into a, a full systematic theology here, the council's going to last a lot longer than all day. Um, yeah, it's 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 not important in a sense. It's just it just doesn't matter, right? Um, who deemed us? Uh, or you know who 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 was the one deeming our doom that we should deem the doom, right? Um, by whom were we called? By whom and for what are these deeds ordered? Um, he does kind of say for what. Right to find counsel for the peril of the world, uh, the world is in peril. The whole world. We all stand alone, and stand together in this peril. Right, um, and so uh, we are being provided with an opportunity. So that the ordering of things appears to be ordering in the favor of all of us. Right, who are trying to resist Sauron. That's um, he does kind of point to that as a, a, a sort of context or evidence of who is giving the order and what that means exactly, right? But um, but he doesn't say any more than that. And I agree, it doesn't really... Uh, it doesn't really matter exactly. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, Matt, I agree that ordered is a nice word choice as it combines both uh, the thing being arranged and being commanded, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, ordered in the sense of organized and ordered in the sense of commanded. Yes, both of those, uh, both of those concepts are included uh, in that wording. I agree that that's, uh, that's kind of nice. Because notice, that's the other thing. So there's, remember when in a similar conversation, Gandalf said to Frodo, and that may be a comforting thought. Right. And Frodo responds by saying it is not a comforting thought. Right. Um, uh, it, it, it strikes both ways here, too. Right. On the one hand. Don't think that we're on our own. Right. Not only do we not stand alone in the sense that we are all together. Right. That we're all in this together. We're also not standing. We are not standing alone in a more ontological sense, right? There is a doom deemer out there who's looking out for us and has brought us all together, right? Um, is one of the things that Elrond seems to be suggesting. And he doesn't add, and that may be a comforting thought, right? Um, but of course, if you wanted, if you were there and wanted to say like Frodo, it is not, you could be forgiven for that, right? As of course it does, as all of you were point, as so many of you were pointing out as I was reading it, sound like a, a quite a bit of pressure, right? Um, that you have been chosen to be one of those who finds counsel for the peril of the world. Or, you know, not, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, Tarloniel, that's a really great question. There's barely a memory of the West in Gondor. She says, I wonder if Boromir has any idea what Elrond is talking about. Um, I wonder what percentage of them do. I mean, I'm sure most of the elves present have some idea what he's talking about, that he is pointing in his vague way towards the Valar and towards Iluvatar himself. Um, but, um, uh, but I agree, Tony, the Wood Elves might not know that they, you know, how clearly do they retain those memories and those ideas? Um, uh, you know, I mean, and the, as you say, Boromir, there are a lot of things the whole question of, like, what is Boromir's perspective? This is one of the things that I really like about that really fun uh, Lotro session play where you play Boromir's point of view in the uh, in the discussion at Parth Galen. Uh, I really love that one. Um, even if just because it is, to me, such a fascinating question. Like, what is Boromir thinking? 
Um, and we'll get several several moments where we can talk about that here in the Council of Elrond, of course. Um, and putting ourselves into his shoes is definitely um, one of the things that I, th- I think we're invited to do, and that I certainly want to do as we're uh, as we're as we're looking. But yeah, is is Boromir? I, my suspicion is that Boromir's response to that paragraph is either like an eye roll or being like, "Okay, can we can we you know." Enough elvish, you know, <laughs> vague mystical statements. Uh, uh, let's just uh, let's just go on. Um, and yes, I agree, Kit. There was no earthly way Boromir was paying attention in history class. Um, yeah, no, we know, we know that he and and I, he did have a vision, Crownless. We'll get there. He did have a vision once, um, uh, but. Does he? I don't know. It is possible, Crownless. It is possible that upon hearing Elrond talking this way, it is so ordered that we who sit here and none of us must now find counsel of the peril of the world that he is he might be like sort of smug, right? You know that he might be like that's obviously granted, right? Um, um. You know, it's uh, it's po- anyway. We'll 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 we'll, we'll uh, deal with what positive Boromir evidence we get over the course of the council, um, but um, but yeah, um, <laughs> or wondering if Faramir was the was, was really the one supposed to be there. I don't think that that's what Boromir's thinking. I am, but I don't think that that's what Boromir's thinking. Um, I agree, Tony. Far this whole thing would sound a lot different to Faramir, I think, than it does to Boromir. Okay. Let's see. Um, Cecilia, there are references to the West and to the Valar in Gondor. We will see evidence of that, right? Even down to, may the Valar turn him aside, uh, right? Say the Rangers of Athelion when the Mumak is coming through. So we know that it's not that they have no memory whatsoever <clears throat> of any of, you know, uh, an idea, you know, knowledge about who the Valar are or that Iluvatar is a thing or uh, or anything like that, right? Um uh, and exactly the prayer of Faramir's men, eternal cow. Absolutely. No, there's there's plenty of evidence that there still is some of that in the culture. Right. Um, but how much it really means to Boromir, how much of it he really understands. Um, uh, even Faramir's explanation is kind of vague. Right. And possibly diluted eternal cow. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly, Tony. I'm not really sure either how much actual theology is behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, okay. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and let's do another slide. Then all listened while Elrond in his clear voice spoke of Sauron and the Rings of Power and their forging in the Second Age of the World long ago. A part of his tale was known to some there, but the full tale to none. And many eyes were turned to Elrond in fear and wonder as he told of the elven smiths of Eregion and their friendship with Moria and their eagerness for knowledge by which Sauron ensnared them. For in that time he was not yet evil to behold, and they received his aid and grew mighty in craft, whereas he learned all their secrets and betrayed them and forged secretly in the mountain of fire the one ring to be their master. But Celebrimbor was aware of him, and hid the three which he had made, and there was war, and the land was laid waste, and the gate of Moria was shut. Then, through all the years that followed, he traced the ring. But since that history is elsewhere recounted, even as Elrond himself set it down in his books of lore, it is not here recalled. For it is a long tale, full of deeds, great and terrible, and briefly though Elrond spoke, the sun rode up the sky, and the morning was passing ere he ceased. Okay. Um, The full tale to none, not even Gandalf, Tarlonio asks? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Who knows? Um, Tony, as you say, Gandalf wasn't there for this, right? Um, He's doubtless 
gotten the briefing before, right? But is it possible that he's um, uh, that he is hearing that there's some of this that even Gandalf is hearing for the first time? It's possible. I don't think that Elrond is keeping holding back much on purpose from Gandalf, right? But um, you know, how many times did they sit and have this conversation? Um, I love the way in which Tolkien transitions from telling us that Elrond is saying this, these things to telling us about these things, right? Um, and keep in mind, there is very little of this that we would know. We got a very brief version of this from Gandalf back in old chapter two, right? Chapter two of book one. Um, in the shadow of the past, we heard about Celebrimbor and the forging of the rings of power, but even there, we did not hear all of this detail, right? Um, we don't, we don't know any of this. We don't know much of this stuff anyway, like him not being able to behold and receiving his aid and growing mighty in craft and him learning their secrets and betraying them. Um, Gandalf didn't say that stuff, right? Um, Celebrimbor was aware of him and hid the three which he had made, and there was war, and the land was laid waste, and the gate of Moria was shut. Then, through all the years that followed, he traced the ring. But since that history is elsewhere recounted, even as Elrond himself set it down in his books of lore, it is not here recalled. Tarlonio wants to know where we get hold of... Uh, Elrond's books of lore. Um, Eternal Cow, I do think that Bilbo translated some of them into the Silmarillion. <laughs> right? Mad Violinist says, the Marquette University Library, of course. Uh, yeah, something like that. Um, There are a couple things about this here, right? One is linking exactly, exactly what you're saying, right? Exactly. Um, Tolkien subtly hinting at his publishers to take up the Silmarillion too. Yeah. Remember that Tolkien publishes The Hobbit and his first response to the publication of The Hobbit and to the popularity of The Hobbit is to try to use that as a lever to get the Silmarillion published because he's got all this stuff, right? He's got all this material. So he goes back and he spends a bunch of time in 1937, the year that The Hobbit is published, right? In the build-up to publication, he's like, okay, the time is here, the time is here. And so he's rewriting the Quintus Silmarillion and he's writing the Hlamas and he's uh, uh, probably writing um, the uh, Embarcanta, all that stuff. So a, a huge percentage of the stuff that's in Shaping of Middle-Earth and The Lost Road, Volumes 4 and 5 uh, of the History of Middle-Earth. A lot of that stuff he's putting together into what would have been the Akalabate. No, not the Akalabate. Sorry, I mean the Anulindale. All this stuff, right, that he's compiling. The Annals of Beleriand and the Annals of Valinor. All these things he's putting together into what would have been this really large volume, Right? Uh, Tolkien is, uh, to say, okay, here it is. It's coming. The day is here, right? They love my book and they're going to say yes to this book. And they don't, of course, say yes to that book. So by the time Tolkien writes that sentence, um, since that history is elsewhere recounted, even as Elrond himself set it down in his books of lore, it almost feels like an inside joke at that point, right? Like a spoiler, not a spoiler. It's like a teaser, Right? Yes, exactly, Eternal Cow. It's like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right? Like, um, since that history is elsewhere recounted, it's not here recalled. Because you can read about that else. Oh, wait, you can't, right? Gosh, maybe, I know, why don't we all write the publisher and ask them to produce the, the history that is elsewhere recounted? Because we could totally do that, right? But oh, no. Gosh, I guess you can't read it, can you? That is, that is tragic. That is tragic. Um, 
Yeah, I just I I, I I and I cannot I absolutely cannot hear I, I can't not hear that in this sentence at all. I cannot not hear that. Um uh yes, I have more where this came from. Absolutely, is sort of the subtext there. Uh no question. Um and by the way, this sentence is if it's never stated where the Silmarillion texts come from, right? Like we know from Bilbo or through Bilbo, but we know that Bilbo didn't make them up, right? Bilbo was, those are his translations from the Elvish and that seems pretty clear, but what was he translating? Who wrote what he translated, right? Um, and uh, it's never explicitly stated who wrote that material. The the most sort of obvious candidate for the author is Elrond, right? Um, and if you want to believe that Elrond is the one who composed the Silmarillion, ultimately, like is the guy who wrote the Elvish lore, uh, which Bilbo was translating, um, then this sentence is, is, is your best evidence for that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Trifle, Ed, yeah, Trifle says Sauron defeated gives authorship of the Akalabeth to Elendil. Yeah, well, the Akalabeth is in a different place, especially after we talked about this a lot in the context of the Notion Club papers and the drowning of Anadune and our discussion of Sauron defeated, uh, where all of that stuff, the Akalabeth stuff uh, specifically, came in while he was uh, making up Adunayak and beginning to do the human perspective. And a massive percentage of the published Akalabeth is taken word for word out of the alternate history text, the from the human point of view text uh, that he wrote, um, which involved a completely different take, uh, even a completely different theology, ultimately, um, on um, uh, on the history of Beleriand and uh, ultimately leading up to the drowning of Numenor. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, any, anyhow, yeah. So, so all that stuff comes in there, um, uh, and so therefore he, the the idea of human authorship of that stuff then is all kind of wrapped up and coming in. I just mean I mean primarily the like the Quintus Silmarillion uh, stuff and uh, uh, and even of the Rings of Power in the Third Age. But the thing is, notice. Um, so that's half of if we kind of think of like the metatextual significance of that sentence, that's half of the metatextual significance. But here's the other half through all the years that followed. He traced the ring. But since that history is elsewhere recounted. It's never recounted. We have no published text from Tolkien in which that exact thing is recounted. Yeah, there's more stuff, right? But. Notice what he just said. Through all the years that followed, he traced the ring. What years? In what years is Elrond tracing the ring? What is he talking about there? Starting from the war of the, the first war of the ring, right? Starting from the war with Celebrimbor. See, no, I don't think... I used to think that. I used to think that he is referring forward to the story that Gandalf is going to tell, tracing the ring from the battle of the at the Last Alliance, right? From the taking of the ring of Sauron to the present. But that, I think, is not at all what he's talking about. Then through all the, ring, the years that followed, that is, that followed the time when the land was laid waste and the gate of Moria was shut, what he just talked about. After the rings of power were forged and there was the falling out between Celebrimbor and Sauron, what happened to the ring of power then? So the years, the years in which Elrond appears to be tracing the ring are from the war with Celebrimbor through the downfall of Numenor and the war of the last alliance. He can't be talking about the Three Rings Flamifer because he clearly says the ring, capital R, singular. 
Um, and that story, what Sauron does with the ring between the, uh, the, you know, the war with Celebrimbor and the Battle of the Last Alliance is never told. It's alluded to. I mean, we get a very, very... I mean, yes, like, there's stuff going on with the Seven and the Nine, right? The enslavement of the ring rates presumably happens in there, right? Um, we get that. I mean, but that's not a story. Um, nobody could call that a history that is elsewhere recounted, right? Would you call that a recounting of the history? No. We know the abstract fact that the ring rates were enslaved during this time Presumably, right? Um, yeah, Scudo says, clearly the One Ring did not leave Sauron's control until the Last Alliance defeated him, but that doesn't mean it has no history during that time. The conflict between Sauron and the Elves was pretty much about the One Ring, so the history of that conflict could also be called the history of the One Ring. Yes, very possibly. Very possibly. And we know very little about it. Very, very little. And there's a good reason we know very little about this, right? Because... Tolkien hadn't, he wrote a lot of stuff. The Silmarillion contains a lot of material, right? And by the time we're here, we've already had, you know, five good volumes of the history of Middle-earth's worth of material from these days. And yet, the Great Ring had not been invented yet. Sauron existed, Celebrimbor existed, sort of, but the Ring of Power had not existed. It didn't exist until he was writing what is now chapter three of the Fellowship of the Ring. Right. Um, so the Silmarillion elements, right, which so the Akalabeth, even the Akalabeth really, but um, again, all of the post First Age stuff, right? All of the post War of Wrath stuff. Um except for some of the early Numenor legends, are all, I mean, it's anything relating to the Ring of Power has to post-date the writing of the Lord of the Rings. Meaning, when he wrote this sentence, it certainly did not exist. It certainly did not exist. Even the sketchy bits that we get, like in the appendices, for instance, right? Appendix A will give us a little bit. In fact, one of the, one of the best versions of it that we get anywhere, which is not much. Um... But we, um, uh, where it's, 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 it, it certainly hasn't been told. Right. So, so I said like half of the, you know, like what underlies this sentence is like that note to the publisher, but here's the other half, the other half of the, this also sounds to me like a note to self, right? <laughs> like, uh, um, but since that history is elsewhere recounted note, Recount elsewhere that history, right? Like, I've really got to think through what happened with, I mean, you know, he's got the whole, like, conflict with Caleb Brimber. He's got the origin story of the Ring of Power worked out, right? He knows he's got the origin story. He's got the Battle of the Last Alliance. And he's got the rediscovery of the ring and the quest for the ring, right? That is the entire history of the ring that Tolkien has invented at this point, right? So, yeah, this almost reads like a kind of promissory note, right? Okay, yeah, so probably there there, there was other stuff, right? There's Sauron probably not idle during those millennia in which he had the ring and before he lost it, right? Um, exactly, Lincoln. I think it absolutely can be a, a nudge to the publisher's uh, a promise to the readers and a note to self. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I just, that's, there's a lot of meta text in that sentence uh, that, uh, that I can't not hear uh, when I'm, when I, when I hear them talking about that. Um by the way, I pointed, I said three things, right? That he's, there are three things that are clear in his head. Um, Tolkien's head about the history of the ring, the Celebrimbor business at the beginning, the last, the Isildur business at the war of the last alliance and the, the Frodo and Bilbo business that comes at the end. Right. Um, notice I've skipped Numenor in that. And I did that on purpose. 
because the Numenorian story predates the Lord of the Rings material, right? Predates the Ring of Power concept. Um, and involved, but involved Sauron. It clearly involved Sauron. He was, it was always the antagonist of that story pretty much from the beginning. Um, but that predated the word, the ring of power story. And you'll notice that even in the Silmarillion, like even in, the, in both the appendix A and in the Silmarillion, it's kind of weak. That is, we're just told that he set it aside Sauron left, like, you know, put the Ring of Power in his memory box in Barad-dûr, right? Hid it under his bed and went off to Numenor without it? We're told that that's what happens. It's almost unimaginable to me that he would do that. But it had to happen that way. Why? Why? Because the story of Sauron going down into the into the abyss with Numenor pre, was already there, and Tolkien did not want to ditch that. Right, he did not want to lose that image of Sauron on his seat of power in Numenor, thinking that he is won and conquered, dropping down into the abyss. Right. Um. But uh, so, in order to reconcile the Numenorean story, which he had already written and was continuing to develop even after he'd written the word, even as he was writing the Lord of the Rings. In one of those, the Notion Club paper stuff in which Adunayak and the drowning of Anadune and all of that enrichment of the Numenor story that we were talking about in the Sauron Defeated class last year, um, all that stuff happened in the middle of writing the Two Towers, right? Um, so it, it's it, it was... it. The idea was there, and it continues being developed, but the Ring of Power, there's no sign of the Ring of Power, even in that material, even in the Sauron Defeated material um, about Sauron. So, um, anyway, yeah, I, um, as I say, that is, that story the story of Sauron in Numenor is in that way, I think, never really, never really fully reconciled to the story of the Ring of Power. Um, yeah, Brandon, I agree. There's sort of more that could be done, right? Brandon says he always felt that the ring not being with him in Numenor saved him, uh, but I doubt he thought Numenor was going to be drowned like it was. No, I don't think he did. Um, would the ring have been destroyed had it gone gone down into the abyss with Numenor? Um, would he have been permanently crippled in that way? Perhaps, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, okay. Not much more to say about that. I just wanted to point out that 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 uh, uh, that interesting fact, um, and also just to remind us that we as Silmarillion readers might feel kind of smug <laughs> as we're going through this passage, right? Um, we might be tempted to be all like, ah, yeah, no, we know this story. We know exactly what he's talking about. Uh, no, no, we are among the people um, who are getting, an, would get be getting an eye-opener uh, were we hearing this, uh, this story. Um, uh, a part of his tale was known to some, a part of his tale might be known to us, Right, um, but the full tale is certainly not known to us. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I agree, Tony. It does help to explain why the Akalabeth and the Rings of Power story are told separately in the Silmarillion. Yeah, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, Briefly, though Elrond spoke, the sun rode up the sky, and the morning was passing ere he ceased. So Elrond takes hours telling this story. Hours telling this story. Um, and 
Uh, which I can definitely believe, especially if it's, you know, longer like than the Akalabeth or something, uh, which you can listen to in a, in a sitting, right? Told at length. Um, but, um, yeah, Tolani says, now that I'm not keeping secrets anymore, you're getting all the secrets. Yes, I'm going to tell you absolutely everything. But again, it, it shows the importance, the importance to Elrond of explaining and contextualizing the whole thing. Right? Um, I'm not just going to tell you the facts. Fact. The, the Ring of Power, you know, is like linked to all of Sauron's powers and everything. No, he's... Um, he is going to um, explain so that they can really understand what this means. Um, having heard this whole story, they will know what the Ring of Power means to Sauron. Um, they will understand that. Um, and so, therefore, that will provide the proper and appropriate context to everything else uh, that they're going to be hearing and discussing about. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'm tempted to go for a fourth slide, but I shouldn't. It is, uh, it is, it is, it is field trip time, uh, and uh, uh, and we should we should stop there. Um, we're going to get next Elrond's personal reminiscences as he goes back and begins to bring the story from the Second Age into the Third Age, um, even though. Elrond has been present for everything that he just He wasn't there. He didn't live with Celebrimbor at the time. He was still out with Gilgalad by the coast. So he was geographically removed from that. Um, but he has been... Um, he's been around. Uh, he's been in Middle-earth for this whole time and, of course, was directly involved um, with the wars uh, after the death of Celebrimbor. Um, yeah, yeah. So, okay. I know, Tony, we're going through the council pretty fast, right? Not bad. Three slides tonight. Hooey. All right. Um, I agree, Tony. Galadriel should be here, too. But as she doesn't exist yet, she's not here. Um, okay. <clears throat> Very good. So we will resume uh, with Elrond's personal recollections next time uh, and then uh, get into uh, his uh, further discussions. Okay. So I'm going to say thank you to everybody. We're going to, we're going to close our uh, text discussion tonight, and we're going to shift to uh, doing our field trip. So I'm going to say uh, good night to the folks on Twitter, um, and uh, you guys can join us on twitch.tv slash signumu if you would like to follow along for the field trip. So thanks very much, everybody. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Valori. How are you? Fine. Happy New Year and happy anniversary, I guess. Wow. Absolutely. Our third anniversary. We've been three full years here uh, in our wow. <laughs> in our travels. That is uh, kind of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a beginning our fourth it's been a fun year. Journey. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Still kind it of was... boggles me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tolkien's birthday, January 3rd, 2017, yep. was yep. Uh, when we started. 2017 yeah. really feels like a long time ago at this point. Yeah, it feels like a... Uh, man, what a year this has been. What do you mean it's only January right now? What? Right, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, oh yeah, and I've actually, before we get too deep into it, Ambrosia St. Aurelianus, thank you for reminding me. I, I, I meant to say this at the beginning. A quick reminder that tomorrow night we are starting our discussion of C.S. Lewis's Out of the Silent Planet uh, in our Mythgard Academy uh, uh, discussions. Uh, so for those of you who would like, having, having read uh, The Lost Road and Notion Club papers with me, uh, if you would like to look at... Um, uh, the the C.S. Lewis side of that bargain uh, we're going to do out of the silent planet starting tomorrow night. So there we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the reminder. Okay. Uh, let us head out. We're headed to Thorns Gate, and it's now much easier to take a direct horse. We don't have to that road up north from Kellandim, which we rode down like fifty times. We we can be Change done doing stables that. Stables of Gondamin, and yeah. Exactly.
Okay, hey, thanks to folks in the Talon. It's been great having you there. Um, see, as we're signing off from two of our uh, two of our places here. All right. I'm gonna mount up here and get to the stable master. Uh huh. And so today, I believe we're looking at the housing area. Yeah, we're gonna start in the housing area, which is, I believe, where I left off last time. Yeah. We'll have a look around there in the housing area, and then we will continue our. We we kind of uh, have seen most of the sort of western side. Can I do for you? Um, oops, wrong horse. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, not not the what winter one. Do for you? Not the festival steed. Yeah, okay. Not that's the different. festival, although that can take you immediately there afterwards. But <laughs> <coughs> oh, sorry. Excuse oh, me. Bless you. Salud. Thank you. All right. There you go. Let me. Uh -huh. Okay. Excellent. So, all right. Greetings. Just gonna ride over there. Or? Yeah, we'll just ride over there. And that's up this way, right up the stairs. Uh -huh. the fastest way there. All right. Let's Bye. head over. So I don't know from fastest, but this is a way to get there. Okay, and we will just, let's just enter the neighborhood that is alphabetically first. Okay, yep. Because they're all some trouble. pretty much the same, right? Yeah, they're identical. Yeah, so. That will make it simplest. It's a shame we're not on land revolt, though. We can't see what we did with the place. You know, just how we completely yes, it's trashed true. dishonored dwarven culture, you know. <laughs> yes, okay, so uh, Ice Garth is where we're headed. Ice so that would be yes. ice meaning like literal ice. I think so, right? yes. Yes. Yeah. It's like uh, the ice garden, essentially. Yeah, there we go. I remembered. <laughs> okay. Um... I love that's right, the I forgot about the criers. Desperate yeah, warriors are struggling to hold back Angmar's vicious assaults against the free peoples. Okay. All is well. <laughs> right. Except where it isn't. Um Okay, I'm looking around I'm looking at banners. News at eleven, but first you won't believe how this dwarf got rid of beard stains. <laughs> Okay, so we have on the inside of the doors, same as the outside, what looks like the Misty Mountains and possibly are the Mountains of Moria. Um, uh, the, the Seven, seven Hill? Am I thinking Rome? Yeah. I'm thinking of Rome. Yeah, you're thinking of Rome. Yeah, a, no, there, the Three Mountains yeah, of certain, Moria. Yes. But, yeah, we agree this is Moria because of the, the peaks and where they're situated. Yes, probably. That this is probably yeah. one of those things that Gimli was referring to when he says that they have wrought the image of these mountains into many works of metal and stone, including presumably the gates to the housing areas here uh, in Thorin's Gate. So the banners uh -huh. on the sides and the top are those same banners we saw in Gondaman. Yes. Big chain okay, which looking guys. Chain yeah. slash sort of hammer that. slash with the like, signum on top yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, do we know if this view from Moria is from the uh, Nimrodel side or from the Hollands Gate side? No, I, we don't. We don't. One thing that I was just noticing is the little foothills at the bottom. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's the like answer. Five, five little hills, it's, right? It's a, there's, but there's two sentry guards and something like possibly out of stone, like that's the entrance. So this. Would well, be I think those else. are the the door handles. The door handles. Okay. But they do look like that. I mean, they do almost like it's almost like they're positioned like towers on that little mountain. Mm -hmm. From the front. But, anyway. So yeah, definitely the definitely the front gate from the Nimrodel side. Uh, 
Probably from the Nimmerdale side. Probably. Well, the other one was pretty inconspicuous and was hidden to look like the mountain. It's not quite as impressive as this little entryway right here. Uh, maybe. Okay, the statues up above. Uh, yeah. Yep, yep. We've. They're very green. Are those green or is that just the lighting? No, that's that's proper green. It's I think it jolly is proper green, giant green. green. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's blue, but the yellow light's making it look greener or something. And have we seen but, dwarf standing with this spiked hammer? You can see it is better over a... here. It's the same statue here. But, oh yeah, the um, one's down on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the guarding the entryway here, yeah. the main entryway. Yeah, big, I don't think we've uh, seen this before. No, no. Not exactly what. Like. Is that a pickaxe or a warhammer? What is that? I think it's a warhammer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean... <laughs> no endorses the, the, probably the, both. Right, I mean, the part that's facing up is seems to be a... Um, yeah, uh, Snorblom is asking if it could be a matic. We are told that they fight with matics in combat, um, uh -huh. which... I always thought was really cool until I learned what a matic was. Um, and then I was just kind of like, kind of puzzled. Um, because of course a matic is, it's like half pick, half shovel. Basically. It's like what you use for breaking open the ground and things. Um, anyway, uh, I, I it look as fragile as a matic. Yeah. It's a flat nose pickaxe, says Karita. Absolutely. Yes. Um, the... Maddox are super handy. I remember, uh, I, I actually, I remember the day I bought a matic. That was exciting. I was excited to go buy a matic, which I needed because like a little, a small tree in our backyard had died. And I cut it down, but I had to dig up the stump, which is like super hard to do, of course, oh, with yeah, any no, size just tree. Left ours right? to die eventually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this wasn't a big. It wasn't like a huge stump. It was like you know the the trunk of the tree itself was only about like six inches across. So I was uh, like, oh, yeah. let's just take out the stump. And I, but it was like super hard to do when I was trying to do what it with a shovel, off. right? But then I went out and I bought a mattock, and I was so I'm like, I have a mattock just like the dwarves of the Iron Hills. And boy, like I took out that stump in like five minutes with a proper matic um yeah but um this anyway might, yeah so this, yeah this one ahead. doesn't have the at's head on uh, the, the sort of plane on, on the back that right the flat matic. part yeah is is not yeah. is not quite matic like but you know i'd the, be willing to stretch spike. a point and call it a war matic anyway yeah, yeah i mean maybe a war matic's different than a functional one you know perhaps so war hammer's different than a regular hammer so why not exactly Exactly. Yeah, and I have to think that they're green because it's 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 either carved out of copper or overlaid with copper, or maybe Petite bronze. Copper. Yeah, I love that yeah. verdigris copper. Um, notice right next to it, we actually have just some sort of natural um, stalagmite right next to it, just sort of accumulated mineral. Oh. Yeah, with the big black thing, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, giant big obelisk thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've That's been cool. like looking all around that and paying no attention to it, but you're completely right. It's this fully carved interior, and they've just randomly left this big, huge lump of rock here. Uh huh. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Because you know what that makes me think of? That makes me think of Gimli's speech about the glittering caves. Right, yeah. um, where he uh, where he talks about how they like tend stone, right? So I mean, because that's really because there's no excuse for it. Like it's not real functional. I mean, if you look yeah. at it, try to look at it from a distance, it's this random asymmetrical, unsculpted, uncar just bunch of stone. But it's almost like the dwarves were carving this out, and they were. Uh, building, they were carving and building both, right? And they just like they got to that one, and they're like, you know what? I just, I, 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 I this is beautiful, right? 
this natural stone so formation. <laughs> yeah, this natural stone formation uh, is really is really lovely. Let's just build around it. You Even can though see it's still growing. Look, I mean, yeah. look to your right; it's eating the stairs. Yeah. Or left. Sorry. Oh, both. Actually. Right. Yes. Yes. Over there, we see another one over there, as you say, eating the stairs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's it's. They let that stone grow on its own, and they let it remain again, even though it throws off the entire design. Right? They've got like a color scheme going with the, you know, the sort of golden yellow stone and the green stone of those obelisks and the green of the statues. Uh, and, you know, so they've got all that work. You know, the, I like the way that the green of the marble obelisks. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, sort of picks up and 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 contrasts even a little bit with the green of the statues, and then you've just got this random black asymmetrical unshaped lump of stone <laughs> in the middle of it. Um. So yeah, that's that's, that's it's green green jasper, green jasper. Yes, yes. So yeah, that's really cool. See, there's another one over here by these stairs, but again, it's not symmetrical. It's on the other side. It's not oozing over the stairs to quite the same degree. It's like how people will incorporate trees into building if they're old and beautiful enough. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so Fort Thomas is asking, how could the stone grow without a volcanic eruption? It's stalactites, or still those are stalagmites, I believe. Yeah, um, stalactites hang on tight. Because if we have it's the uh, like, when we look yeah, around here, these appear to be stalagmites of a similar kind. Yep. Yeah. Um, so there would have to be a drip in the ceiling somewhere. Um, I agree that there doesn't seem to be a complementary point above that it's growing from. Um, but it is possible. It's hard that, to tell. Uh, I can't, can't look up that far without just looking at my horse. Yeah, it, it is. It is kind of hard to, hard to see for sure what is up in the stone above it. The air, the, the, the ceiling part was open above them, so it would certainly be possible. It's also possible that either some of the stalactites fell or that some of the stalactites, like they might have chosen to take some of those out to smooth the ceiling. So they, they opted to remove some of the stalactites, but they left the stalagmites growing. I don't know. It's possible. Yep. You could even imagine, of course, if they... And dead, so. Yes. Yes, it's it's possible that even if they wanted to take out the stalactite, one I can imagine the dwarves, by some feat of engineering, actually contriving to have a drip continue onto the stone there, so that the stalagmite could continue to grow, even if they took out the stalactites up above. That that is um, true. I mean, with all the the living area here, um, living bacteria is not conducive to healthy caves. But I wouldn't be surprised if dwarves managed it. Yeah, it's quite possible. Quite possible. So yeah, no, I think that 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 I am suggesting, Kit, that the dripping could definitely continue. Could even be, in a sense, artificially fostered, right? Like a by um, yeah, absolutely. Why not? Why not? I, um, I, I mean, I that, love that. I'm enchanted by that idea. I love it. That would be. This would be, remember again Gimli's words about um, about tending those groves of flowering stone, right? Um, a very similar thing we could understand to be going on we could understand to be going on here um, okay so who's this I wonder, see, one guy's saying I'm shocked you speak so highly of what was it Mordred long ago defeated has returned to Angmar. Oh, do you think I could not make something half as impressive? I'm shocked to see you see you speak so highly of such a crude rock. A true master artist created this. The statue? So they're debating about, yeah, the statue. They say it's made of rock. Not bronze or copper. Not bronze or copper. It was it like malachite? What is that? Mordred Gasper? I don't know. That is an enormous... Uh, Snorblom is suggesting possibly granite. Maybe. I don't remember seeing granite quite that green, but no. maybe. Maybe. It's definitely quartz. It would have to be some sort of quartz-based. Yeah. 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 
Brickdale says that according to Wikipedia, stalag stalagmites grow 10 centimeters every thousand years, so it would be a really long-term project. Uh, yep, yep, uh-huh, sure, it absolutely would be. Now, I'm not suggesting that that um, stalagmite we were looking at back in the entry area grew from nothing since the construction of this area. Um, m the point is, the idea is that it was already there, and they just didn't remove it. You know, they, they built around it, essentially, uh, when they came in. Um, but um, uh, but that they would... So it probably hasn't grown much since then. But, uh, uh, but, but yeah, they would um, uh, encourage it to continue growing. So I'm seeing jade, I'm seeing praseolite, I'm seeing jasper again. It's something like jade. I mean, in that quantity, who makes, who carves, who carves, you know, megalithic statues out of jade? That's crazy uh, talk. I think jade uh, seems a little unlikely to be jade. I think it's definitely a hard quartz of some kind. Yeah. Adventure green, maybe. But who is it? Ah, uh, he's got a crown. He's got a war mattock. Now that this, I think, is like a hammer. A mattock. Or, oh, or a hammer. No, actually, I think it's because I think it's square on both sides. If we looked at it oh, from over here. Oh, you're right. You're right. I thought it was flat on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. From this from side, it's yeah. Yeah. Only got the yeah. X and the Y. Um. Definitely heroic pose. Look at the movement in the beard. Ooh, the that is a really interesting idea. Fourth Thoughtless says, what if this is Mahal about to smash the fathers? What if this is Aule? Yeah. Lifting his hammer to smash Durin and company. It certainly implies he made dwarves in his own image. Right. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if a dwarvish statue of Aule looked like a dwarf. Just a really big dwarf. The I could totally see that. The of the Valor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I could totally see that forth. I love that idea. I don't know how likely that would be to be actually true, but that's pretty neat. So, to my knowledge, he never wore a crown. No, but you would put one on him to just show that he's the boss. I, I mean, there's no evidence he wore a big, huge, like, WWE championship belt like that either, but, like, you know... <laughs> If he's outlay, he can do what he wants. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a title that's a title belt for sure. It is a title belt right there. Yeah. Um, well, not having any other immediate theories as to who that could be, I'm gonna go with the with the outlay theory just because it's it's awesome. It's cool, but also keep in mind where we are and who it's named after, so. Yeah. It could just be Thorin, you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, this is the, the neighborhood of Thorin, so. Yeah. Let's see if we can find yeah. any more evidence, maybe. Yeah, okay. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. So look, I'm just looking around at, like, a random house over here. Of course, like, people put, erect the things in their yard. So, um, like this tree is not native here. Where's the so tree I already from? see some... Oh, it's a fang or Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So look at the bright colors on this. This is much brighter color than we usually have seen from our fire architecture. The stone, so you mean like the, the, the red stone? The bright red. Yeah. It definitely looks like paint. You can see where some of it's dripped over time into the gutters. Oh. So you think this is painted like painted marble? Um, or maybe coated or shellacked. It's shellacked. Yeah. <laughs> Time to re shellack the house. How else? Well, yeah. it's, you, it's, you gotta keep water out of the joints. Especially if it's dripping like this all the time. Why not? Why not? Cock it. You have to, you know, it's cock it and yeah. see it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, that is interesting. I mean, even that by itself, by the way, seems an interesting thing, which. Now that we think about that, we can see evidence for that kind of thing. Look how the red is running down the sides here. And we saw yeah. that, too, with the green, even as far back as, 
Kelodul, the um, the port city, with the green was running down. I do know, as far as pigments go, red is a very durable color. Yeah. Places like Ireland and and other places that are cold and wet, they like they like to use red pigment because it can withstand the wet elements a lot better. Yeah. So. Yeah, there could be some rust involved, but again, just look at the right below the top of this. You can see the red kind of running down the sides. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting. I would not necessarily have assumed that the dwarves would paint, like would color stone artificially. It'd be a bit like staining, like really. Well, it's it, like it depends on the stone. I guess it's like you know how you, you have you ever met like a, a woodworker like who does like real mm-hmm. nice furniture. He'll right, always right. tell you that you know if it's a really nice wood, you don't stain it. You stain the crappy right. wood to look like better wood. Right, right. Maybe I was just coming up here because I saw this bricks. building that looked different. Mm-hmm. But also uh, notice the. Despite the color, there were very similarities to that house we saw on the hill, the, the woodcutter's lodge. Oh yeah, sure. No, it, the 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 architecture, the yeah, the structure of it was all um, very very long beardish. Yeah. From beginning to end. What is this wall reminding me of? It's got the whole ah. long beard arches. This yeah, looks like yeah. the wall leading up from the south. It's just like the wall that you pass through on the way into Thorns Gate. Yeah, the main gate. Yeah, the main walls on the outside and running the perimeter. Yeah. I think we saw something like this in um, where was it? Across from Nogland in the early long beardian before it gets yes. tower handy. Exactly. Is there exactly. something in here? Oh, it's for sale. Is the house for sale here? You want to go inside and take a look? I mean, it's unfurnished, but... Oh, hey, there's... Yeah, the, where? Which one? Right, oh, yeah, right the here. one with the flashing sign. Sale, which means... Yeah, which means we can take... Which means we can go park. in. Yeah. Nice. Ooh, oh, yeah, this now, is this lovely. One, this one does not have the brightly painted exterior, which probably implies it's made of nicer stone. Yes, yeah, so you've got this whole courtyard here. Oh, I, I get it. I get it. The small houses were made with cheaper stuff. Right, sure. So that's why it's painted. Makes so the nicer sense. the house, the less you're going to see those artificial colors. Okay. The stone speaks for itself. Highly polished floor stones in here. Probably polished by a fair amount of boots over the years. Possibly so. Yeah, you can see the realtor spent all the time showing you how great the floors were, but left kind of left the walls alone. Right. Even with the, like, cracks in them. Mm-hmm. So this place could use some love, but I'm seeing maybe <laughs> a playroom But at the same time, here. though, you know, there's, there's something like the walls feel more like natural stone, whereas the floor is, like, clearly laid in highly polished... You know, tiles. Yeah. Notice the, the the sort of windows here don't have the, the bright glowing glass like we usually see either. It's either dingy or the that part just isn't in there. Right, yeah, it does look like it's just stone. And then... Oh, yes, it's the... Little fireplace. Oh, gross, look at what's all over the stove here. It's some sort of build-up. <laughs> Seriously? There is. Look, uh, yeah, look over on the, Ooh, the bottom. Oh, up around the top? The trim here. Yeah. Yeah. It's some wow. sort of mortar leaking out, or maybe it's some sort of uh, like a rust or a lime buildup or something. That's unpleasant. Wow. Boy, somebody should really speak to the realtor about that. Yeah, they need to knock the price on this one down a bit. Oh, seriously? And, like, you're going to leave one of the great doors just askew like that? Yeah, fire hazard. Oh, man. Well, then again, there's nothing to catch fire here, really. 
not that's this true. Huge this is not a big firework. This house, yeah. Yeah, unless the tiles are made out of compressed powder, and then we're in trouble. Well, yes, yes, I suppose really we really low be. ceilings. I'd of course, I was always uh, as low as I was always very disappointed that I couldn't cook at the <laughs> stove in my personal house. I actually have a personal yeah. house here in uh, Thorns Gate. Mm-hmm. I remember we had our big fellowship house for um, Fifth Garden yep. in Landreval, I believe. Yep, we do. Next time we're in Landreval, we can peek in at it. Yep. Look at the, tr the trim's very nice. I like the trims on, on this room here. Again with the fives. Mm -hmm. Just like that little trim along the bottom of the door beneath like what looked like foothills in front of the um uh you know the mountains of Moria there um the pattern of the you know, these five overlapping squares is interesting interesting because I don't understand it um <laughs> me neither on the floor we have yeah. that Okay, so I also, this does look like a, a window or a mirror or something, but it's neither. I mean, this seems to be just stone in there. Yeah, usually we see a jewel sticking out of it and glowing. Yeah, that does happen or can happen, but I don't really understand what the function of these things is, or if there is a function, if it's just decorative. Maybe it's... Um... Maybe it's like a very thin stone, like a mica, or maybe some kind of horn, and the light from oh, so the inside to shine outside. Yeah, it could right. be translucent. Iced in glass or something. I don't know. Possibly. So when we see it glowing, it just means there's a light on on the inside. Does it glow on the outside? I don't know. I don't know, let's see. I agree, Dragon Rider, that uh, if you had windows in a house in a cave, it wouldn't be to let light in, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. No, and... it's, it, they're both they're both blanked in on these. Yeah, they're the blanked both The glowstone's on the directions. outside here. Yeah. Yep. Yep, the glow is from these, yeah, these external crystals. Oh, look at the sort of rose window on the door here. Oh, yeah. Little. And it's a legitimate window. Mm -hmm. Little sexagonal flower thing here. Yeah. Or snowflake. Yeah. It seems to be glass. And um, Dragon Rider, also about the light. You'll notice that it's snowing. Um, we are open to the sky, not everywhere, but in places. See, like there's a hole right there. Mm -hmm. So it's nighttime outside, but daylight would come in here. Um, Which is also not great for the stalagmites and stalactites. Uh, they would right. be tended to keep going. Right. Um, and of course we do have, I don't see large quantities of lighting crystals. There seem to be some, such as, hang on, let's see if we can get to that bridge. I think so. There's the bridge. I like, I like seeing the snowfall. We've just had our first snowfall of the year over here, so. Oh, yeah? We've had a it's lot of snow so far. We've had like three. My kids have had like three snow days already. Um, we always get them from cold and ice, which is not the same thing. It doesn't count. And no. It's not a cost for cookies and hot chocolate. No. It's not nearly as much fun. Um, Yet. But, uh, yeah, okay, so we've got these clusters of these crystals, which are being used as illumination. More, more like street lights than. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you don't just kite off a bridge. <laughs> Although, oh, you could it definitely need you some can more of that bridge. railing over here. Yeah, look at the yeah. look. Look how uh, how the guide rail just suddenly sort of stops here. Yeah, yeah. There's this there's this alarming gap here between the wall and the bridge, where you could completely miss. It's like it was taken out by horses and they just never got around to replacing it. Yeah. 
This is a this is a thing. Oh yes, this is the outdoor mine cart display. Nice wow. outdoor mine cart display. Beautiful. Wow. This is fabulous. <laughs> and a miniature orc siege tower. Sure. Wow. This guy's got everything. It's like Trolley and Mr. Rogers. He's got his own little track. And... <laughs> it's like Trolley. Oh, wait, this is built in. This is not... Uh... Oh, no, it is. It's an ominous pool. Okay, there we go. Uh, an ominous it pool. It says on the tin. Yeah. <laughs> Just like it says on the tin. Absolutely. Uh, there's that statue. People get yard, you get yard items as quest items, uh, quest rewards in various places. Um, I have a bunch of very random things at my own personal house when I think to go back there and put them there. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of different places you could go and things that you can do to get yard items. Things like, like buckets of tentacles and tents and giant rocks. Yeah. Oh man, this huge statue is a yard item too. I thought that was... It is. Oh yeah. Oh, it's Dan. Oh, the Dane Lick. Yeah, Dane. The Dane Lick. Okay, so apparently that, and that's the same one as that's like the, the Matic statue. He's not green here, exact, but that looks to be. That is exactly right. Yeah, I think that's it. So the other one, so that was Dan all along. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, right. So you, oh, you 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 get this in the Iron Hills, Snorblom. I can believe that. Yep. Cool. Thank you, Home of the Twin Guards, for educating us with that. Neat. That was awesome. Okay, Your house cool. Is awesome. Well, I am. We should probably go pretty soon as it's getting quite late now. I yep. just wanted to go down to one of these columns and take a look at that. The artificial columns, not the natural columns. Uh-huh. Yep. Snorbalm, I'll Can't get there eventually. Chased. Yeah. Got all the, the geometric shapes on. They almost look like the images, the, the signum that was on the banner. That yeah. It does look a little bit like that. Yeah, I'm going up top here. So can, here we go. Love all the geometric patterns and the tiles on the floor and on everything. Very Art Deco. Very appropriate for us being in the 20s now. <laughs> oh, there's like green lichen all over this. Yeah. That's what I was noticing. See, that, it kind of surprises me that they wouldn't scrub away. <laughs> this, Cultivating oh, the yeah, growth of the stone is one thing. It's yeah. All over it. I it think is. it's still in committee. Maybe they haven't. Yeah, maybe. Maybe they just haven't, uh, you know, detailed the lichen scrubbing unit up here. Well, it also indicates that tending the live stone is more important than tending the already mined stone. Possibly so. Okay, we got Possibly they could use again. the lichen for something snorable. I mean, I kind of like the idea that they've discovered some property of it, so they let it grow and then sort of harvest it. You do need oxygen in these case. I mean, we got our own. That's true, stuff, right? But... Lichen for photosynthesis, you're suggesting? Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know what the properties of lichen are. I know it's like a form of a fungus with two different types of moss. It was now determined it's two instead of three. I mean, instead of one. It's a symbiosis okay. of three entities instead of two. I only just found this out. I am so oh, boring. Oh, there we go. Yes. Yes, I find I know almost nothing about lichen, actually. Um, it doesn't seem to be bioluminescent, Snorblom. Um, I mean, that's a good suggestion, but I don't. It doesn't look like it is. Um, Maybe it's delicious. Who knows? Maybe you could just come down and like lick the pillar, you know? And that's like, 
a thing, you know, like you want to go rock have, clicking, laddie. <laughs> you just have a big party here in the in the public square, and like everyone can just go and browse on the pillar. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yeah, uh, a I nice a, pillar I looking. I see the HOA is embezzling funds that was meant for like and claim. <laughs> that also is possible. There have been cutbacks this year. So the lichen is raging out of control. Uh, um, but for yeah, some reason, yeah. Snorri has that new uh, snow blower. Exactly, Amethor and I agree. I think it would uh, if they if uh, Standing Stone included a dwarf just standing next to one of these columns and licking it. That would be hilarious. <laughs> that would be excellent. Just not no explanation, no dialogue, just a dwarf <laughs> licking the column. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That would be that would be completely epic. Um, yes, they would. Right, go gone through only at times of festival. Yeah, or can they have it like? Would different pillars have different flavors? Possibly, you know, like you could kind of, you know, <laughs> have some troves. Yeah, you have like the sampler, you to, right? You have to trick people yeah. into thinking it tastes good. It's like find well. the mango flavored pillar. You know, like in this, it's. <laughs> There could be oh, no. so Black many. Black licorice. Last <laughs> yeah. wax. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Birdie Bot's many flavored pillars. That's <laughs> just what I was thinking. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. No, so much potential there. Okay. And with that um, <laughs> elevating, uh, dignifying thought... I'm going to say goodnight. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Fun touring the uh, housing development here. And we will get back um, uh, We'll get back to the uh, rest of the Thorn Gate settlement uh, next week uh, as we return. Same time, same place. So thanks, everybody. And I will see you guys next week. Bye now. Good night, everyone. Don't lick the rocks. Don't lick the rocks. Probably not safe. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.